What qualifies us to be ambassadors of the kingdom? What allows us to be able to go out and declare to people the good news that their sins are forgiven? Well, first off, when Jesus sent His disciples out, He said, I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. When the kingdom was in full manifestation, when the kingdom came as it did on the day of Pentecost, came with the gift of the Holy Spirit into the world, when it came, Jesus anticipated its coming and declared to His disciples in Matthew, the 16th chapter, I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Religion would have us believe that all we are are worthless slaves. There was a time when we were worse than that. But everything changes when you become a citizen of the kingdom of God. God has prepared in advance these realities and the truth of these realities for us to walk in. We were created, the scriptures say, in, first, in the first chapter of Ephesians, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, for good works which God prepared in advance for us to walk in. Biblical predestination is not the question of whether or not God knew that whether or not we'd be saved. That's, that's not biblical predestination. When the Bible speaks of predestination, it speaks of God creating in advance of your birth a destiny for you to walk in. That's described as good works created in advance for you to walk in. You see, you are not an accident. You're not a thought in the mind of God or you're not, as it were, a nobody. God anticipated your coming into the world because He, was, he knew He would make you as much as He's the maker. He knew He would make you and He did not create you as Descartes, the French philosopher, suggests, as a blank slate. It is not true that because you think you are, that the proof of being is thinking, cogito ergo sum. It's quite the opposite, sum ergo cogito. I am, therefore I think, because God knew you before you were in your mother's womb and, and wrote a destiny upon your spirit. You came here for, for good works to live out a pattern of destiny that is characterized as good works which God prepared in advance, in advance of your being here for you to walk in. When you understand this, it changes everything. And one of the main things it changes is the idea that you have to sort of figure out a way to please God and keep Him happy. Otherwise He hates you or otherwise He has no use for you, no purpose for you. That's utter rubbish. That is so far from what is true that only a depraved mind could think that up or a mind influenced by the evil one could think that up. God created you with a destiny in mind complete with the living out of that destiny. So when you come here and God saves you, you become experientially acquainted with the goodness of God. And when you are someone whose life's testimony includes the understanding experientially of the goodness of God, then you are a witness of the things that you are sent to teach. 
it is because you are a witness of the truth and that God arranged it before you were born for this grace to appear to you, for you to be able to see and understand the goodness of God. These, these are the definitive steps that qualify you to be an ambassador of the kingdom. Yes, it is a very high sounding term, ambassador of the kingdom, and indeed the functioning of it is no lower than that. You are qualified to, and God has caused it to be such that you are able to declare the goodness of God. But that's, that's for the dual reasons stated. Number one, that God arranged it to be so before you were born. And number two, when you have actually had the experience of being translated from the powers of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God, and now you know the reality of living in the kingdom. And we said earlier that this happens when you're born again and you're born of the Spirit. When you're born of the Spirit, you not only see the kingdom, but you enter it. When all these things come to be true in your life, by the way, that's a reference to John the third chapter, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. When these things come to be true in your life, you're a witness of the grace that you are sent to proclaim. Here is what Jesus said to his disciples. This is from Luke 24, 48. First in 47 he says, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Did you see that? You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. What qualifies them to represent Christ? They were witnesses of the truth of the things He proclaimed. They walked with Him for three years. They saw Him do what He did. They themselves would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so in anticipation of all of that, He was commissioning them to go out and to tell people, repent, change your loyalty from being under the kingdom of darkness and under its king, repent of that and seek refuge in the kingdom of our God. As we have is the obvious implication. We have done so and we know the truth of that transformation. We are witnesses of it. We testify to the truth of it. In that sense then you can be and you are an ambassador. Your sins were forgiven when you came into the kingdom and you didn't do anything to deserve the forgiveness of these sins. You, it was given to you as a gift. Why, why a gift like this? Because man is trapped in sin and it's sin that keeps you legally subject to the evil one. What do I mean by that? The wages of sin is death. It means when you sin, you incur the consequence of being separated from God. Anything and anyone that is separated from God is subject to the control of the one who himself resisted God and rebelled against God. When man sinned, whose advice did they listen to? When man separated himself from God in the garden, he didn't become a neutral creature. This act of rejecting the counsel of God was entirely motivated by the lie spoken by the enemy to man. When Satan said, if you eat of the tree, it will make you wise, that was the basis of their choice. Neutrality is not one of our choices. You can't choose to be neutral. You can choose to obey God or you can choose to obey the devil, it's one or it's the other, but you can't choose just to remain neutral. What would be the neutral ground? If you're not with God, where are you? Is there neutral ground between God and the devil? No. Jesus said it this way, 
You're either for me or you're against me. The only one who benefits from a deception that says there is a neutral ground is the one in whose camp you already are, who simply doesn't want you to know that you're already in his camp. Because that way he can control you with impunity. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So when you testify to the grace of God that has appeared to you, namely that you are saved, you're walking in the kingdom, you're experiencing a life of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, when that's the reality to you, you don't need any particular schooling to be able to tell somebody else that. If you have the sentient capability of understanding what your life used to be like when you were lost and now you understand what your life is like now that you're saved, you're qualified. You are qualified. Why? You're qualified because you're a witness of the truth. The whole idea of having to go to school to become an evangelist is nonsense. That's just to give you a speech, a spiel that you can can spit out on cue. The kingdom is so easy. We have made it complicated because it's not the kingdom that we represent then. Then we represent our religious points of view. If you are a witness to an accident, an automobile accident, let's say. Are you capable of going to court and testifying as to what you saw? Of course. What special schooling do you need? How long should you go to school to learn how to testify? It's a simple matter of being able to say what you've seen, isn't it? Who actually draws the words out of you? Who tells you when you are to speak what you know? and when not to? And who tells you what it is that you should say when you are to speak? Simple, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit draws something out of you, it's not something with which you are unfamiliar. If if you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God, the Holy Spirit is perfectly able to put words to that in the presence of someone who is seeking access to the kingdom. It's really not that complicated. You're an ambassador because A, God intended you should, that you should have the keys to the kingdom, which is to open and unlock the kingdom to others, and B, you're a witness of these things as the truth. And if you needed any further incentive to understand that, We've already shown you from the book of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, how you have been duly appointed and constituted an ambassador of the kingdom of God. Here it is. Verse 18 of chapter 5 of the book of 2 Corinthians. All this is from God, that, it, that is, being, being a new creation, is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. How did you get this job of reconciling men to God? God gave you the ministry. But I think, but you've grown up in church where you can't have a ministry unless the pastor approves. You can't have a a, a ministry unless the church approves. That's just institutional Christianity. They want to put a stranglehold on everything that God automatically and clearly and without effort does. It doesn't matter what condition you're in. If you have known what it is to be translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of God, you're a qualified witness and God makes you an ambassador of the kingdom that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore, by this process, we've been constituted and appointed. We are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God himself 
who are making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So you're qualified if you're a witness because God has set it up to be so. Now, people get very um, nervous about the, 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 the thought that I've put forth before that God sends you with the intention of declaring the forgiveness of sins. Why would anybody be nervous at that? Did we not just read? Here, listen to this statement from 2 Corinthians 5, where we just were moments ago. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, here it is, not counting men's sins against them. In this day, we call today the day of salvation, do you know why? Because today, today, people can be saved, saved out of the control of the, the, the kingdom of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God. Today, people can be saved. How is that possible? Number one, Christ has died on the cross. This is the time following the cross. Number two, because your sins are paid for, God is not counting your sins against you. Do you understand how radical this biblical concept is in today's church environment? You buttonhole the average church member today and ask for a description. Ask them how they see themselves before God in respect to the matter of God's love for them. And their answer will be something like, well, I know that I am just a sinner saved by grace. That's been popularized by preachers from a hundred years ago and preachers today thinking that that's a statement about humility have kept on perpetuating this idea. But the truth is you used to be a sinner. But once you're saved, you're a son. You know, it's not all that hard to be saved. There's coming a day when it'll be impossible to be saved. And there was a time when you couldn't be saved. But today is the day of salvation because today God is not counting men's sins against them. That's why you can go and say to someone, as the Spirit leads you to go, to one He's already called, that's why you could say to them, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because God is not counting their sins against them. You know, the fact is we read these things in the Bible, but we don't believe them. In fact, for the majority of churchgoers, they've never even seen such things as these in the Bible. The reason is, that if, the, if the church were to to show these things, they wouldn't know how to, how to teach them to understand these things. I mean, here, this is your own Bible. Hmm? This is not a Sam Solon edition of anything. It says that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. I challenge you to turn to your own Bible and check and see if that's what it says. Now you know that was always there, but tradition, tradition has you believe that people can be nothing more than sinners saved by grace. There is no biblical reference to that concept. That's an evangelical concept popularized about a hundred years ago by the likes of a Billy Sunday or somebody of a, of a, of a later vintage and that's been picked up by various and sundry preachers and religious groups thinking that that's an humble statement. That statement is not accurate, but what it does is it forbids you from entering into your ambassadorship. The church has to put you through all kinds of training models and you have to get the right grades and the right diplomas and the like so you could go and be an ambassador 
for the Lord Jesus Christ. These folks are standing in the way of the truth. The truth is God gave you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The truth is that God is not counting men's sins against them today. So it's no big deal for him to have you declare to someone that his sins are forgiven. Why? Because that's the condition of the world today. Today is the day of salvation. It's not a great deal, it's not a huge matter for you to go and under the leading of the Holy Spirit declare to someone his sins are forgiven. It's only when the knowledge of sin is used as a control device to get people to toe the line that is made into a big deal. If you saw it the way God sees it, then it wouldn't be a big deal. Am I saying that sinning is not a big deal? No, you haven't heard me say that. Sinning is a big enough deal to keep you separated from God, to send you to hell. It's that big a deal. But the fact that your sins are forgiven is what I'm trying to emphasize. And that God would send you who have experienced the forgiveness of your own sins to tell somebody else that his sins are forgiven, that's, not the, big, that's the thing that's not the big deal. Why? Because this is the day when sins are to be forgiven. Why doesn't God just wave the wand and forgive everybody's sins? because some don't want their sins forgiven. Who are they? Those who are bound by their traditions, those who love the life they're in. But, but everyone, until someone comes to them representing the kingdom, everyone is controlled by the error of the enemy. So God sends you to find those and actually He will lead you by His Spirit to those whose sins you are meant to be the instrument of God by which the declaration that their sins are forgiven would take place. This is your ambassadorship. Your ministry in principal part is this. See everyone, every believer has this ministry. You may do many other things, but this is a cornerstone of your ministry to be a witness to another of the things you know to be true. Well, do you always go to everyone? If that's so, why do you not simply go down the street, buttonhole everyone who comes into your line of sight and say to them, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. Why wouldn't you do that? And the answer is because no one's sins are forgiven unless they apply to the kingdom for refuge. So you have to engage them long enough to know whether or not they are someone that God has sent you to declare this truth of the kingdom. The, the classic case of this, you see we're not just sent to forgive people's sins, but we have, we're empowered to cause their sins to be retained. Well, why would you ever not forgive someone's sins or declare that someone's sins are forgiven since you can? Well, the answer is you must discern who is actually seeking God and who is just playing with it, playing with the truth. Classic example in the scriptures are the two thieves on the cross. One of them, he's a thief, he's a con and he's running a con to the end. He says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, come down off the cross, get me down and and I'll believe anything you say. And the other one, also a thief, one on the other side, said to him, shut up, leave him alone. I know you, you and I are in this trade, we're thieves. We deserve what's happening to us, but He did not. He has done no wrong. He turns to Jesus and He says to Him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' reply 
was to say to him, Today, today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, was that thief saved? Of course he was. Wherever Jesus was going, and they were both dying, he was going with him. What about the other thief? Both of them talked to Jesus in the closing moments of his life, and theirs as well. What about the other thief? He died in his sins, of course. He was so close to the salvation of the Lord, but did not avail himself of it. The Lord did not forgive his sins. Did the Lord know he was going to die? Of course he did. Did he not try to persuade him to accept salvation? No, he did not. No, he did not. Why not? Because the man was not looking for salvation, he was just looking for a way to get off the cross. Don't waste your time, hear me on this matter, do not waste your time with people who are happy where they are. God didn't send you to persuade people to change so that they would accept the salvation of the Lord. He sent you to witness the truth to them, but He means to draw them Himself. How can you tell whom He has drawn and whom He has not called? The answer is discernment. You are, in, you are empowered to discern and by discernment you can tell whose sins are to be forgiven and whose sins are to be retained. Don't waste your time with people who have not call, been called. What if you're wrong? No matter, God will send someone else. He'll, he'll cover you in the matter. If you make a mistake, no harm will come to you or to them. But you are an ambassador. This is the day of salvation. You have been given the keys of the kingdom. You are sent to represent Christ. Live the truth of the gospel of the kingdom. I'm Sam Solon. God bless you. I'll see you next time. Bye bye. I know the plans that I have. They are good for you. They are good for you. I know the plans that I have. They are good for you. They are good for you. And no matter, child, what voices you heard.